Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am so happy to be here with you, Seema. It's so lovely to be here with you, Varuna. And uh, wow, I'm so excited actually be to, to be talking to you. What an amazing lady you are. <laughs> well, you know, this is funny because when I started my journey, I was actually doing a lot of work on, you know, decolonizing sexual health practices. And I came across your work and I think that I think it's just come full circle for me that I'm, you know, this far into my career and I'm finally working with you. So the pleasure is really mine. Let's rock this particular conversation. I'm so looking forward to it. Yes. Um, so today, you know, as as you know, and uh, as everyone knows, we are talking about self-love and self-pleasure. And there are a lot of you know, definitions on the internet, you know, whether you read an Instagram sort of carousel or you Google it. And, you know, I think that everyone's definition is, is different, you know, based on our own lived experiences. So um, Seema, you know, what is drawing from your own personal experiences? How would you define self-love? So I think I've finally come to an understanding of what self-love means to me, because, you know, you go through the idea of self-love in so many different ways. I finally discovered that self-love to me is about becoming visible to myself. You know, for a long time, um, you push yourself to the back because you, you tend to put yourself at the very last rung. Everything else gets done first or I don't know, it's just like a million different ways of looking at it, but I think the best way I can describe it is where I became visible to myself, where you suddenly notice who you are. You, you, you understand that you are somebody, that you're an entity, that you exist, that you have emotions, you have feelings, you react a certain way, and you begin to understand all of those things about yourself. You, you, you say that you are someone here who is worth noticing. And that to me is self-love because like I said, for the longest time, that didn't exist. I love that because I think so many of us, especially growing up in like a sex negative collectivist culture, right? We are taught to put the needs of others over our own, that our feelings, our thoughts, our actions have to take a back seat for the collective good. Um, and, you know, coming from a culture where, again, I think that, you know, a lot of us are on autopilot, right? A lot of us don't yeah. really think about our needs. We are totally on autopilot. And I've always said this, well, I've been saying this for a long time that, you know, um, this idea of pleasure, let's go to the, this idea of pleasure. It's a Shakti. You know, we yeah. say that our Shakti, our energy is, sits at the bottom of our spine. It's um, what other people might term the Kundalini. When that Shakti rises, it's an energy. It kind of courses through your body. It, it isn't divided up into, okay, I'm going to have this much energy for just my brain, this much energy to go and do my cooking today. It's energy. You right. deal with it. It's a whole thing. Right. We've been taught over so many years that any kind of sexual feelings, any kind of emotions, any kind of um, desires are bad, they're sinful. And you learn to shut them off. Just imagine yeah. that you're raising your energy and then you're shutting it down at the same time because you're blocking off parts of your brain. We really do ourselves so much injustice. We do. I think the biggest thing that I can say is that, you know, when I, like I said, when I actually started this journey of unlocking those little parts of me, those little bits in my head, which said, I am an entire person, I realized that I always felt that I could be amazing in everything but there was always something lacking in me because as a woman I could never sort of say to myself that I was a complete woman because there's always that little block off you yes. know and so you you kind of judge yourself for that so I, I went into academia and I, I know I can study hard and I know I can do really well I'm gonna work I know I can do that you can pretty much conquer every bit of you but when it comes to you being a woman, with everything that goes with being a woman, whatever that might be, you kind of cut out half of it. Right. You know, everything from when I, um, you know, you're told you're, you're dressed provocatively. 
You go out of your way to prove that I'm not that kind of person. I'm not going to dress provocatively. I'm okay. Or, you know, you, somebody actually wrote to me, this young girl, and I was just so touched. She said, you know, I've been wearing nude lipstick forever which is something that I've been doing. And as everybody knows, right now I'm in India, I'm visiting uh, Delhi, it's very, very hot. I am in nude lipstick, but I generally now have started to wear bright red lipstick. I'm 60 this year, four years ago, I started to wear bright red lipstick. Wow. I've, become, I've given myself the right to be visible. I've actually given myself the, the power to say, it's okay if I'm seen. For the longest time, I was pushing myself into the background. So, yeah, I think it's about um, acknowledging yourself. I want to also say over here, you know, there is a ritual. About, um, I, I was actually going to do a reel about this, and then it was just so hot, and I couldn't bring myself to sit and record. But, you know, when the Kathakali dancers, when they go on stage, yeah. when you get dressed, you wear these long shawls around your neck, and there are mirrors at the bottom of your shawl. Right. Okay. So when you put on your mask, when you put on all that makeup and everything, you actually look at yourself in the mirror after that to see who you are. Because you have to recognize yourself before you can go out as this new person with this mask and makeup to perform. You cannot go out there and perform if you don't know who you are. You know, you have to recognize yourself. And I always say that this is one of my ultimate self balancing tools is sitting with myself with a mirror every morning. And most people are like, oh my God, you're so vain. I'm not being vain. I actually feel that I wake up a new person every day. I want to see who I am. I want to read what my eyes are saying to me. There's a different expression in my eyes every single morning. I wow. want to become aware of who I am. And self-love begins over there, just acknowledging who I am. So, so often, I think, you know, we do think that something about self-love and self-pleasure is like inherently sexual and it, it can be, but I think what we're trying to say, and, and at least what I think about it is that, you know, we are multidimensional beings. We have so many different facets to us, right? We are not a square, you know, in fact, we have multiple faces and multiple surfaces, right? And I feel like, especially for a lot of us who grow up with this kind of intergenerational trauma, we are forced to be in survival mode where, you know, we often cut down those, those parts of ourself and we want to fit in that box. And I think this is probably true for a lot of people. And, you know, even earlier you were saying, especially being a woman, right? We cut off and, and I'm a practicing Buddhist and it really brings me back to like one of the teachings I have, you know, in, in Kagyu Buddhism, which is you you chop off your own limbs sort of is almost as it's sacrificial um, that you're like giving it up. But I think that that's part of what we do oftentimes is that we cut away parts of ourselves. We cut away and we chip away and we chip away until almost nothing is left and we can't even recognize ourselves. So I almost love that analogy you were talking about Kathakali dancers, you know, from Kerala who, you know, look into the mirror. And I think that's just something so beautiful about that because it really does take that depth of self-love, of self-pleasure outside of something that's, you know, inherently sexual to be like, this is who I am. Like, I am a multidimensional being. I have many, 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 many layers to me. I'm almost like an onion. You can feel it and it'll keep going. Um, and, you know, and I really know, The most to... important thing, sorry, just to interrupt you. The most important yeah. thing is if you, if you cannot know yourself, Right. You cannot know anything. I mean, that is it, isn't it? It's like, if you don't, if you cannot recognize yourself, absolutely nothing out there is within your grasp. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring this up at the very end, but, you know, given that we are talking about the mirror and we are talking about almost, and this is something that I was thinking about when you were talking earlier, um, that oftentimes we look into the mirror and, and we, we have to do a lot of the work ourselves. It also involves a large bit of healing, but you know, when it comes down to it, right? Um, it's almost as if many people don't have the time to develop the certain skills that it takes, right? So 
you know, it's, it's so important to almost find that balance in the mind, you know, finding that rebalance. If you feel like you've been off balance and also you were talking about the energy and sort of the Shakti that we hold. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, something that you talk a lot about with this Chan Sat Kalas, which, you know, you mentioned that it's the 64 life skills of the Kama Sutra and that it'll help you develop a personality for success. And, you know, I kind of really wanted you to maybe give a little bit of an introduction to the people here. So my darling Varuna, for everybody out there who is um, from <laughs> Chennai and has a Tamil accent. So that's the Chan Sat Kala. Okay. <laughs> that's so cute. I love it. But having said that, you know what? If I had to say something in Tamil, I would be far worse. So you're doing it well, okay? Don't, <laughs> don't let anybody tell you that we're making fun of you. We're Thank not. you. Um, I think you're amazing. So the chance of color, so the 64 life skills. You know, a lot of people, the moment you say 64 skills of the Kama Sutra, people are like, um, it has something to do with sex. It has, it is not about sex. The chance of colors. Now, if you read the um, introduction to the original Kama Sutra. It says that the Chonsak Kalas are the 64 skills that you need to get through life. So the, the, going back to the beginning, the Kama Sutra was written in 300 something AD. It yeah. was written to teach young, urbane, wealthy men how to live the perfect life. So it's divided into seven sections. The first section is about how to build your house, how to find the right property. Um, you know, it's, so it's got to be on the side of the river, it should be facing in this direction, how many bedrooms you should have, how you should decorate each bedroom, how many hours should be spent uh, by a man in um, getting massaged and, you know, so on, how many hours he should spend talking to his minor birds, it, all of that. So the, the, the Kam Sutra is um, quite a diverse book. The second <laughs> section is about the arts of love, the third section is about how to find the perfect wife. Blah blah. So you know, it's a it's a long book. The sixty four skills. It says, uh, you know, these and they range from things like singing, dancing, music, playing music, um, agriculture. So gardening. It, it has mineral mineralogy, um, woodwork, metallurgy. Literally, even filling up the pichkari. You know, at Holi, you play with the pichkari. The Right. The, the water thing, even that is one of the 64 skills of the Kama wow. Sutra. There are, and there are things like word puzzles and word riddles and understanding how to solve crosswords and so on. So there's a lot of things out there. And it says that the basic idea is, it's um, one is survival. Yeah. So, you know, to live the perfect life, there are certain things that you need to do. And it also goes on to say that if ever you're in a foreign land and you lose all your money and you're left destitute, if you know the 64 skills, you can then teach them to other people and you will not only regain your money, but you will regain your, your uh, status as well. Power, but yeah. this, the second thing, which to me is really fascinating and it's such a modern idea, it says that it makes you a diverse personality. So the more things that you're interested in, if you can talk about this, if I can talk about this, you know, if I can talk about 10 different subjects, you're, you're going to be a lot more interesting to a lot more people. Absolutely. So it's what made you a diverse, interesting personality. If we bring it right down to its bare basics. And, you know, I mean, one of the skills, for instance, the very first time that I read the John Sattkala's, the 64 skills, cock fighting, cock and quail fighting. And I was like, why? I mean, like, what, what, is, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I tell you what, apparently it is something that you would do if you were entertaining, if you had a party at home, after the party, after you'd eaten. So it basically, I'm going to give you a little background. So it basically says that um, if you're going to be with your beloved, so you've invited your beloved over and you've invited a bunch of other people over as well for a party so that, you know, like you're spending a nice evening together. After the party is over, you provide entertainment. And cock and quail fighting was one of the things that you provided for entertainment. And anybody who could do that meant that, okay, you were a really good host and other people would want to then go to that particular party. You would want to be part wow. of that, um, that <laughs> whole setup. And yeah, so it, it made yeah. you an interesting person and made you a desirable person to hang out with. 
you know, some of these suggestions sound really calming, right? Like, and I, even when I read cockfighting, I was like, okay, just to, okay, that, you know, to us, it may be sounds. And I wonder if they've updated the list, but there are several things on that list. I think that, you know, I think it's sort of the message that rings true, right? That you, if you move yourself from that internal point of focus to an external one is often what I say is to just get out of my own head, get a hobby, um, something, and I think a lot of women now in the 21st century, they should add crocheting to this list because it is really a life skill. And I've seen people make really cute things out of them, but I think it's something just that's so primal about using your hands almost. And I think mm -hmm. one in particular that I really resonate with is, is gardening, right? Is our connection to mother earth and something that, you know, it breeds patience, it breeds compassion. It teaches us to play the long game. And it tells us that you know, if we think of humans as plants, right, we, our feet are on the ground, you know, we're walking, we're all sort of different types of plants, and each one needs that individualized attention. Um, and I, and I say this to everyone that I meet, that my husband would often tell me that, you know, don't be a carpenter, be a gardener. And I think what he really tries to say when he says that is that, you know, I think a lot of these life skills and the way that you practice these life skills can translate into how you communicate and behave with other people, right? You're not just the most interesting person, but it, it fundamentally changes something about yourself, right? You know, we are playing the long game with gardening. It teaches you to be more patient with your partner. It tells you that, you know, you, you don't have to mold them like clay. You're almost sort of giving them the resources. You're giving them the time. You're giving them space to grow. And it's not just them that grows, it's you as well, right? You become seasoned, you become someone who understands that, you know, you really are playing that long game. And, and I, that's something that always sticks with me because I always feel like I'm trying to tell someone exactly what to do. I'm, you know, telling my partner that this is exactly how I want him to behave. But it's, I think it's almost futile, right? To have those rigid expectations. Not really that, Varuna, but if you think about gardening and, you know, we're talking about gardening as, um, as uh, you know, a garden grows differently through the entire year. Yes. Right. And yeah. I keep saying this to people, you know, your relationship is different every day. You are different every day. You have to understand that just like a, pl a plant will not produce flowers 12 months of the year. Right. You cannot be the same. You can't be productive all the time. You can't be fabulous all the time. You can't be Love happy that. all the time. You're going to have your yeah. low times. We beat ourselves up over that. Right. Or if you see your partner going through that, you know, the, the fights yeah. that it, you cannot expect the other person to be the same every single day. Every day is a new day. And you have to learn from this. And, yeah. you know, okay, so I'm going to tell you one of the most fascinating things about the Kama Sutra and about this idea. It's the next book, actually, that's coming out. It should have been in three years ago, the, the manuscript. I'm still kind of dragging my feet over it. But <laughs> the Kama Sutra mentions 30, 30 love festivals, Kama festivals. Wow. Okay, so we now celebrate this one Valentine's Day. So we have 30 which is spaced mostly in springtime, but they kind of go through monsoon, through autumn. And the idea with these spring festivals is, or these love festivals is that they're all based around nature. They're all based around plants because they believe that if you can bring mother earth to her full pleasure, if you can make mother earth blossom, that filters down to human beings. Yes. Okay, so we pick that up, we pick up those vibes, and it sort of makes everything greener and lusher and happier. And so there's a bunch of um, festivals that actually are things like, um, you know, there's one particular spring festival, which I think is fantastic. It says that such and such a tree will only flower if women go and pour a mouthful of wine on the trunk of that tree, it'll burst into flower. Otherwise, it won't flower. Another tree will only flower if you put alta under your feet, you know, the red paste under your feet. Oh, wow. Yeah. And touch it to the tree trunk. And that's like, doha. that's like passing your desire onto the tree to flourish. And the, the alta, of course, has a very, very deeply intimate sexual 
um, association with pleasure, because in ancient times, as you know, Alta was one of the, um, uh, the, the Sola Shringhar, one of the, the 16 ornamentations of love, because again, this is something that I always say to people, you know, we don't treat love making as something beautiful and special. It, it's become so um, run of the mill. In yeah. times gone by, you were going off to meet your partner, you were going to have uh, sex, you were going to make love, you dressed up for it. Yeah. You know, you didn't kind of wash off your makeup, <laughs> put on your old nighty, turn the light off. You got dressed for it like you would for a party because it was beautiful. It was joyous. It was fabulous. So you would get dressed. And the most popular, one of the most popular positions where, is where the woman would be underneath with her feet on the man's shoulders. Okay, so you kind of get the architecture of that. And um, the altar would rub off on his forehead. And no matter how hard he tried, the stain would be left there. So you saw a man with a bit of red over there. You knew what he'd been doing. No. <laughs> you see, it became um, a metaphor. Literally, you know, this whole idea of taking a woman's feet to your head. Well, it meant that you were lovers. So wow. It meant you were going to make love. So that's the idea of the altar. So now imagine, you know, the woman painting her feet with altar. And knocking against the tree with that foot, it's about passing the desire on because as the woman, you're the microcosm, the tree is the macrocosm. And, you know, there are any number of these fabulous festivals all to do with nature, all to do with bringing it alive. And, you know, the very first festival that took place as spring came, kings and wealthy men, et cetera, would actually have um, these mock forests created. So right. a king would have lots of space or a wealthy man in his garden, you know, they'd have this little hill made and on the hill they would have all these trees planted or if sometimes they would have cutouts of trees and then they would take along this group. So it would be like a picnic group of men and women who would sort of wander through there and you had to identify the, the trees and if you got it wrong, you forfeited a kiss. So there are any number of games and um, nice. just beautiful rituals based around the idea of gardening so yeah go be a gardener yeah go be a gardener right and it, you know oh, from what you're God. also saying right is like a lot of people even ask me is like how can I be more connected to myself how can I be more sensual and one of the biggest things I do say is you know go out and be one with nature, right? And I have a tree that I talk to and I, I, I think it's silly, but now that you're talking about this whole tree thing, I'm like, maybe I'm, I may be onto something because I do lie under a tree and I have conversations and it's not sexual. It's almost like I'm telling the tree and like treating the tree like it's my ancestor and that I am one and that I'm the tree's child. But you know, all that aside, I think that really going out onto like mother earth, digging your feet into the sand. I think, you know, that's calming, getting wet in the rain, um, finding ways to like hug a tree. Sometimes I hug a tree just to feel more connected. And I think, you know, those things are not really sexual, but they're almost sensual. They're almost something that you can do directly to connect yourself, right? Because you are a soul and you're trying to connect with another soul almost and I feel like things like that you know even if you're not really into gardening from you know I think many people aren't into gardening and living in urban spaces really doesn't give us sort of that um, space to garden really like we don't have like a lot of people in the suburbs have a big garden and things like that but almost thinking about the ways that we can get in touch with mother Earth, the way that we can find that sensuality within ourselves you know, um, end of 2019, before lockdown, before COVID started, I was in India and um, I'd been working really hard and I was totally burnt out, totally. Right. And I took three days out and I went to um, Daman, you know, Daman and View. So I went to Daman and um, I actually found this quite by chance. I, I went alone. I stayed with a friend and I would spend all day just going alone onto the beach and walking. There's something very different on the sand that is the wet part of the sand, which is on the beach yes. in Daman, not yes. the Gujarat side, the Maharashtra side, because there are okay. two sides to it, because one side has got all the industrial waste that comes out. So it's yeah. quite dirty, but the other side, and there's just something about the sand over there. I found myself walking through it, the way that it massaged the bottom of my feet. I cannot yes. explain it, but you know, Varuna, 
and anybody out there listening, take a trip down to Daman, go walk on that sand barefoot, the wet part of the sand. I came away feeling like I had had six massages. Wow. I just felt so calm. I suddenly felt like I was alive again. I was human again. So, um, yeah, you're right. Wow. You, you connect with nature. And we always feel guilty about self-love or about putting that time aside to do this for right. ourselves. Or, you know, there's always this guilt. Like, I always say, oh, my God, this is my guilty pleasure. Or, oh, my God, or no, I should, should be I be working. doing this? Yeah, yeah. this is the should time I, I should be working. This? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, there's an old Hindi saying which says, Jaan hai, Jahan hai. That if you have life, so life not just as in your breathing and you're alive, but if you are fully alive, you have the world at your feet. Everything belongs to you. When that light goes off inside you, inside right. your brain, everything goes. From your creativity, to your happiness, to your relationships, everything goes. And I wanna say that if you as a person are miserable, right. everybody else picks it up. You know, 100%. you lose your relationships. For the first couple of days, people will come around and say, oh, let me help you feel better. But, you know, After you can't just pick yourself up and you will, you will end up losing your relationships. Your first responsibility is to yourself. Because if you can look after yourself, you can look after your loved ones. When you lose out on looking after yourself, your loved ones lose out on you. You can't look after them. And I, many people think of this as being selfish. Like, I think there's often mm. the term where they often say, like, I have to be selfish. And I, and I don't think it's selfish in the way that, you know, it has a negative connotation. It, you know, wherever you are, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? You can't be the one that has to fix everyone else, that has to, you know, fix that relationship if you really can't even fix yourself. And I think this is where almost the 64, I, I would really encourage, I had a great time kind of going over the 64 life skills. Even when I came across cockfighting, I was like, I wonder how that would do, you know, in the 21st century. But even sort of, if you need an idea, you know, of something that you want to do with your own life and that you're looking for a new hobby and you need that time and that's you time, right? That's almost a, a part of you that's just for you, right? That you get to visit and you are cultivating within yourself. And I think that's just such a profound way for you to connect with yourself and also spend time in nature. Like, I think everyone should go for a walk regularly, go hug a tree, you know, people might look on. Uh, someone mentioned having indoor plants. Talk to your plant or listen to music with your plant. You know, I was also thinking about using your other senses as well. For me, I grew up by the beach in Chennai. I'm from Chennai. I grew up by the beach. And I think that has been such a, you know, it's almost like a part of me. And I'm, you know, I'm getting married by the beach this year. And I feel to me, I couldn't oh. explain it to anyone. I was like, I need to hear the waves crashing and I need to feel my feet in the sand. Because to me, that's almost as if I was born there, that I found that light, like you mentioned, that I found that light and I was like, this is who I am. This is a part of my personality. Like I'm almost, you know, one with that beach. So find a part of the city, talk to your plant. Um, my husband has a collection of plants that he refers to as his children. Um, I think it's very cute. He has these relationships with them, um, you know, and talking about my husband, I think one thing that I often trip up on when I talk about my husband is the fact that, you know, in addition to a lot of the cute rituals we have and the quirks and the things that he says, um, we go to couples therapy. And many people often view couples therapy as being something that new couples don't. So we are, have been five years together and we've been going to couples therapy at my behest um, for the past year and you know I do work in sexual health and I you know I'm a feminist and having multiple degrees I kind of see from my point of view kind of that therapy is beneficial to everyone and he's a psychiatrist so you know I think for people like us it's something that's like okay we have access to it let's go and utilize it but I think to a lot of people like my parents they were like why you guys you know haven't had children yet and xyz and I really say that the major thing that we go to couples therapy for is to learn how to communicate with each other 
right? Because we are two different individuals who have had whole lives before each other, right? Like I have a whole different life and I'm a whole different person outside of him. So, you know, from reading your work, you know, I, when I'm in therapy and, you know, coming from a science and an academic background, you know, especially working in public health and medicine, everyone likes to use these super technical terms like Gottman's therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. And, you know, maybe you need to see someone who's, you know, LMFT and all of those sort of abbreviations. But I really wanted to go into an art form like um, Shyan Rachanam. And of course, if I'm if I'm butchering, you know, with my Tamil accent, you can let me know that. But um, how does that, you know, something like Shayan Rachanam sort of tie in with the other communication techniques that are taught in, you know, modern science? So actually the Shayan Rachanam, so it's close enough. Shayan Rachanam, okay. Shayan Rachanam, which is the art of making the bed, is one of the most incredible things that I discovered when I started um, studying the Kama Sutra. But just before I go there, I just want to say, you know, from what you were saying about going to couples therapy as a preemptive as you know understand so you start off on the right foot to understand how to communicate etc and i was just thinking how um, amazing of these young people of both sabha and sanjeet to have decided to do a corporate health event based around this to actually have the forethought to say that this is a good idea to do and talk about because people just don't especially not in the yes. corporate sector so yeah. I am. I, I just want to say out there, Sanjeet and yeah. um, Sabai, if you're listening in, that I think you're really amazing and very far-reaching. So that's extremely good. Um, yeah. Okay. So coming back to uh, Shayan Rachanam, you know. Um, so basically, it was the art of making the bed, where you um, made the bed in such a way that you indicated to your partner whether you were welcoming them there that day with happiness, with anger, or with indifference. And like I said before, you know, every day you're different. You're a different person every day. Your emotions are different. Just because you're in a committed relationship, it doesn't always mean that your partner comes to bed and you're like, yay, I'm ready for sex with you. Let's just do it. I'm going to be so passionate. <laughs> you're feeling different every day. And how you end up being intimate with that person that day totally depends on how you are feeling. And it is so important for your partner to be able to understand that. But of course, nobody's a mind reader. You know, somebody comes in, they might not be able to tell if you've got a smile, but like a gritted teeth smile, they might not be able to tell that you're really angry. They might think you're happy. Well, I have communicated this and it is up to my partner then to keep this um, this particular interaction, intimate interaction with me, according to the way that I am feeling as well. So, you know, our emotions match. The idea of being intimate is that it should always be joyous. It should always be a wonderful thing. It should never leave you feeling like shit. Yeah. And I think that it's incredible because you can't always say it. You can't always verbally communicate and say, I feel really rotten today or you know what I'm just bored today I just want to lie back you do everything I'm just going to listen out for the, the metro that's a little bit late today or whatever you know what I mean like there are many times that one does just, but there are days when you're in it and there is when you're phoning it in. you're not there yeah. and this was the ultimate means of communication according to me it's the EQ and consent at the highest possible level where you say, okay, you're my partner. Yes, I am welcoming you, but this is how I am feeling. So you acknowledge how you feel and then you go forward. So you're not, there's no pretense. There's no, none of this thing of having to put on a good face for somebody else. I just think that yeah. that's just so amazing. And yeah. it works both ways because, you know, you, you understand each other's feelings and isn't that the most important thing? I find that a lot of people will do that. They read their boss. They yeah. walk into the boss's office. They'll look at how their boss is looking and they'll say, okay, the boss is looking happy today. Today I can be really cool and I can be funny. Today my boss is looking extremely angry. I need to tiptoe. So you look at people who you think are important right. to be given the respect and you respect them by giving uh, then giving attention to their feelings that day. But we never, ever look at our partner and our intimacy and lovemaking with the same respect. 
And I think this is where we are lacking mostly. This is why relationships end up in the sort of stalemate that they do because we're like, oh, yes. yeah, hey, you know? So yeah. yeah, my basic thing is that if you can actually give that respect, it doesn't take very long. It doesn't yeah. take very long to give somebody the respect to understand that they feel a certain way. It could be that they feel like that for a month. It's okay. It will right. pass. Like the seasons pass, you know, the floral season will come back. It does happen. But yeah, I think human beings are human beings and they're right. not machines. And we need to learn to treat them as human beings and not machines. Since going back to the plant analogy, and it's, it sounds like there are a lot of plant lovers in the chat where, you know, there are some days where your plant maybe is looking a little limp or maybe looking a little overwatered and sort of you view that and then you change so almost your behavior immediately. You don't go and crush the leaves or throw a tantrum or... or Why know, aren't you looking good up. today? Yeah. Exactly. Why can't you just cheer up? Like, what's your problem? Yeah. Like, I'm trying so hard. And it's, I think, I mean, I awesome. know it's December. Well, why the hell aren't you flowering today? Exactly. Yeah. Right. And it's yeah. like, come on quickly. But, you know, it. I love that this conversation is almost really going amazingly full circle and we're kind of incorporating. And it, it sounds like, you know, the Cheyenne Rachnam is a dance right? It's an art form that, you know, and in Bharatanatyam, it's, it's, you know, when you dance with someone and, you know, I went for Bharatanatyam classes, if there are some people who are Tamil or even, you know, who is watching Bharatanatyam, you know, there's almost that facial expressions is such a hallmark of Bharatanatyam. And you can really tell wh what someone is feeling just from the hand motions and the face and the eyebrows and the micro expressions and the non-verbal cues, right? And it, it's almost a dance. The other person sort of tries to understand what the other dancer is doing and they go back and forth and it's coy. And I almost feel like, you know, there's no sort of, and I, I like to say this a lot that, you know, we may be, and you may be the expert, you know, in, in, in these art forms. And, you know, I may be an expert in, you know, sexual health education and things like that, but there isn't really a guidebook that we are writing that says you have to behave exactly this way, right? Everyone is so different and every couple has a unique, you know, you have to develop your own unique blueprint, right? Of like my partner, um, I don't know, does this really funny quirk when he's upset. That means that's kind of my signal to maybe like how would they say immigrant parents bring you fruit when, you know, they want to apologize. So finding like a very cute ritual, like what's a quirk that you can pick up on? I think that when I'm working from the bed, my husband can almost pick up that he knows that it's a downer, like that day is a downer. And then he goes and he picks up food for me from like KFC or something so I can just binge together. So kind of, it's so important that everyone kind of develops their own rituals with their partner. I, even with yourself, I think, and that's what we spoke about earlier, right? Is when you really understand yourself, what ticks you off, what turns you on, you know, what, what does intimacy look like for you, right? Because it's so different and you are an individual who has so many unique characteristics. Um, and, you know, someone, I got distracted, someone is asking what Shayan Rachna means. Can you define what exactly it means? Yes. Yeah. Shayan is the bed, Rachanam is the ornamentation or the making of the bed. So it's the art of making the bed, literally. Oh. Yeah. So just okay. like Vishnu uh, rests on the coils of Anantanagi, that's known as the Anantashayan, you know, the, the bed made of uh, Anantanag. Shayan just means bed. Yeah, um, I think that was also really good for me to, to hear that. Um, sort of moving on to one of the last points that I had was um, Kamayati, or the art of seduction is the art of understanding how to arouse feelings of karma or desire in others. Um, for you, how does this relate to interpersonal communication? So, okay, the word karma is something everybody's familiar with. Karma means love, lo love in many different ways. Kamaayate is the um, conjugation. So it basically means arousing that same karma in somebody else for you. And it basically is something, so I've just been studying a semester with um, uh, Dr. Saskia, Ker Sa Saskia Kersenboom, who is at the University of Netherlands, and her um, specialty are the Devadasi traditions from the Tirutani temple, wow. okay. um, and from the Tyagaraja um, worship. 
uh, and she was, uh, you know, we were looking at a goddess. So the uh, Tyagaraja in the um, Tirutani temple and in a lot of the South Indian temples, Tyagaraja or Shiva is with three goddesses. So you have Yoga Shakti, who is the Shakti, the, the, you know, the, um, the goddess who brings forth. There is the Veera Shakti, which is like Durga, who is the outside, the, you know, the Shakti from this thing. And there is the Bhoga Shakti. Bhoga Shakti is the goddess of pleasure. So these are the three who accompany Tyagaraj. And um, to me, this idea that, and the, uh, the Devadasis were the keepers of the traditions of Kamayate. Now, I, I want to tell you this because I just think it's fascinating. So it says in the Tyagaraj story that, um, you know, as, um, before, as he is sakal, as he's nirgun, as he's sort of formless, you know, all the gods as they're out in the cosmos, their eternal souls. As Vishnu lies on Anantanag, Shiva as so, uh, Soma, so Shiva, Uma with Skanda, as a little statue lie on Vishnu's chest. And yeah. this is out there in, um, in the cosmos. One day, there is a little icha that arises in Lord Shiva, a little bit of desire. We are the only culture in the world that talk about origin as desire. Everybody wow. else is about sin. It's the original sin. Adam and Eve are yeah. thrown out of paradise. Da, da, da. Yeah. So <laughs> icha arises. And as icha arises, a flower is born from the earth, right from the base. So not falling off the mountain or falling off tree, right from, it's called the Bhoga Lolika. That's the flower. So that's sort of comes up. And the idea is that, you know, the gods live in Ananda. They live in eternal bliss. We are aiming towards that, but we are not gods and we can't gain eternal bliss. We right. can work towards it. And that working towards it is Bhogam. So we, we can only experience bhogam, pleasure over here in its many different ways, which is why bhogam, as we see it, you have the Kama Sutra or whatever, it's very, very procedural because with everything that you do, the idea is to elevate yourself gradually. You know, it's to elevate your feelings, it's to elevate your desires because gradually you're working towards moksha or ananda. Yeah. Now, I just think that... Um, Kamayate, I mean, I want to say very specifically that I've always said that you cannot seduce somebody. It's not like, oh my God, I'm going to seduce somebody. It's not something that you right. can do to someone. Yes. Seduction is a, is a, it's a state of mind. Yeah. It's how you feel about yourself. So it's how you are that you present yourself that you arouse in somebody else the desire to be with you or the desire to love you. And I think that circles back to the idea of the John fellas, you know, just sort of yes, developing your personality, becoming, yeah, becoming that person who is, the, you know, people are drawn to you for what you have. I mean, something that is missing in them, which they come to you for, right? It's that, that thing inside you that draws you. If right. I find somebody who has an incredible energy, there's just something about maybe their laughter, maybe the way that they're talking about it. I, I find myself drawn to talking to them. I want to hang out with them. I want to be right. with them. Right. So it, it, Kamayate is a little bit of a complicated idea, but it's basically this idea of being able to arouse those same feelings of karma in somebody else for you. That's what the, the general meaning of it is. How you put it into practice is a very different thing because we spend a lot of time trying to fit in with other people. And you have to. We live in society. You have to sometimes fit in with what other people want or right. they want to think about it. And we all do. You know, we all come into peer pressure. Yeah. We all do to a certain extent. 100%. I have found that for me, it's just been a case of growing up. It's come yeah. with experience it's come with time I really I wasn't taught as a child I wasn't taught how to be confident for myself I wasn't taught how to be amazing because I am amazing I had to learn this for myself 
I try and do this for my children. I try and say to them, okay, you know, this is amazing when you do this. And when they do certain things, I try and encourage them because I, I want them to be able to develop those things and say, well, right. this is what draws other people to you. We are never taught these things. And these are the sort of things that the Devadasis were actually taught. The courtesans of ancient times before the Devadasis or different ways were taught certain things. You know, it was all about how you made yourself somebody that people wanted to be with. Does that help? Yeah, no, I really, it reminds me of two things, which, you know, the term, I, I heard the term peacocking on how I met your mother. And I think that because we've lost that ancient form of developing sort of that personality or that reflective self-love, right? That's almost like we are um, a water body that someone looks into and sees themselves or wants to see themselves or the version of themselves. And what ends up happening, I think, especially now is kind of this idea that if you go out and buy the right clothes or if you like get look a certain way or if you ex and all that is is great. I mean, all that is beautiful, but I often think that it, it almost doesn't fill that that inner desire that we ourselves have that almost is deficient. And that leads me to a point where I think I was thinking of this memory recently, and I'm 31 right now, I'm happily married. When I was 17, I was madly in love with this person and I really wanted to do whatever they want. I, I, was, I wanted to be whoever they wanted me to be. And I think this is so common when you are young, when you're 17 or you're a teenager or an early adult is, I will do whatever it takes for you to love me. And I think that's what pushed them away. Um, and, it, and the relationship ended up turning sour. And I, and I remember going on a lot of these dating websites being like, how do I need to talk? How do I need to behave? But I think that looking back almost, I, I think, you know, when I talk to my younger self or I write to my younger self, I said, if only you had sat in that discomfort and you had told yourself that maybe I really need to develop some sort of a life skill that makes me love me. It was almost as if I was really looking for that external validation. And, and it sounds like when you have, and I love how you took it back to, you know, the, the 64 life skills is, is really, and, you know, when we were talking about self-love is being able to build a home within ourselves that we visit, right? That yeah. we can sit with, that that's within us that we say, I'm going home, but it's really us. And I think that when other people look at you, and when other people hang around you, they can see that, right? They feel that attraction, um, not just talking about sort of that primal sexual energy slash attraction, but it's really like, that's a cool person. I really want to get to know that person. I really would like to develop these areas of myself. And I think that I really just want to be around that person. And, you know, even not just doing it for others, even just doing it for yourself, right? I think really building nurturing ourselves I think is is what's the most important absolutely and I think I'd like to also say to people that not to confuse this idea with say because there's always going to be times when you're with somebody and you want to make them happy because that's what yes. really you want to do that's whole that's entirely different yes being yourself and being able to love yourself and being who you are and being this amazing person is very different. It, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, it's not that, okay, I'm with somebody and this makes them happy. Okay, they like to have this food. And today I really want to make you happy. I want to make this food for you, even though of I don't course. like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there are things that you will do for your, your partner because you really want to make them happy. That's a whole different thing, you know, because it is very easy to confuse. It's like, okay, well, um, what if I want to do something to make, I think that's a wonderful thing. We're talking about who you are and being able to judge yourself for who you are, which yes. is really important. I do think that it's extremely important for us to be able to, like I said, I was never taught how to love myself. Yes. I was never taught what was special about me and that it was okay for me to be like that. And do you know what I mean? Like everybody is different. 100%. So yeah. today I had someone today at um, the, the parlor. I went to the parlor to um, 
you know, um, when I went for a pedicure, actually, and, uh, you know, because I love my pedicures. Anyway, and the, the gentleman who owns the parlor, as I came out, he said to me, sorry, I'm going to say this in Punjabi, but basically he said in Punjabi, he said, you know, you're such a beautiful woman. Why have you let your hair go gray? So I oh said, because I really like my gray hair. And he was it like, good. huh, but you know, if you dyed it black, it would be so much nicer. And I was like, yeah, but I like my gray hair. And this <laughs> went on and on. And he said, but it makes you look older. So I said, but I am older. I'm 60. And then he kind of went into this, oh, okay. Well, you have very firm skin. I said, oh, thank you. But, you know, then he went back to saying, but you should really color your hair. Anyway, we finally finished with this. And I said, it's okay. I'm really happy the way I am. When I started to go gray, a lot of people were like, no, you can't do this. You can't, you know, just learning how to love yourself right. for what other people might think are your warts. Nothing inside you is a wart. It's just who you are. Yeah. It's just it's coming back to self-love. It's just coming back to that idea of becoming visible to yourself, acknowledging that, yeah. okay. And everything is not a wonderful thing either. We are not all wonderful. Totally and absolutely. There are things yeah, inside us. We're not us talking about being vain yeah. or narcissistic. It's like absolutely. a healthy like, attachment to yeah. self. And you know, once you can actually acknowledge who you are, the things that you can understand, the things that you can acknowledge, you can actually learn to manage them better. It's literally right. that simple. If you become aware of something, you can manage it better. So I think it's really, really important to understand that self-love I mean I guess we've come right back full circle to self-love that um, <laughs> yes. it it comes from this deep sense of I am okay by and large right. and and honestly okay so I had this guy once say to me you were talking about this guy that you were in love with and where it fell apart and a lot of young people will say oh but you know I'm with this person and I want to hold on to it. because there is when you're younger there is that thing yeah. In not so long ago, I had this guy who thought he was flirting with me. Okay. Um, I, I was traveling before COVID. I was traveling a lot. So I was on the road literally every month. I was traveling to somewhere. And uh, he says to me at a party, he says, oh, if you are my wife, I would never let you go jauntering around all over the world. I would make sure that you stayed with me all the time. And I was like, that's why I'm, I'm not your human. wife. <laughs> yeah, you idiot. I mean, this is not somebody saying, I love you and I'm going to tie you up in chains and keep you over there and make you different because you, you, you think you're in love with somebody who is a certain way, but you want to then own them, change them completely and make them somebody else. Have ownership. And, as, yeah. and there have been times when we were all younger, when somebody says that to you and you're like, oh my God, that's so cute. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, every bloody Bollywood film depicts oh, I was one say, extra, yeah. you know, possessive hero, like, you yeah. know, beat everybody else up. Don't you dare go out anywhere. I'm looking yeah. after you. Shit, no. You know, it's like, no, that's not it. No. Now I'm older. I take that as a huge insult. I, I think, how yeah. dare you think that you want to change me into what you find somebody else, you know, find a clay model. Yeah. Like yeah, go exactly. find some clay, make a model and say, this is the woman <laughs> I want to be with. Don't do it right. to me. Right. And I, it, it's because you know who you are. Right. And I feel like it's, that's, yeah. that's what we need to be teaching. Like, especially young girls everywhere. And if I had to teach, if I had to teach um, sex ed, you know, the first thing Varuna that I would teach, and I say this all the time, I would teach people, that everyone will have feelings for somebody else and everybody will experience rejection at some point. Oh, 100%. The other person will go away, but we don't tell anybody that. We tell, we tell people off for feeling desire towards somebody or getting excited or getting attracted to somebody. And because we make it sound so guilty, you don't get to talk to anyone. And then the moment you feel that you have been rejected or the other person oh, walked away from you, you think it's catastrophic and you think you're the yes. only one in that place and you're then heartbroken and you can't deal with if you think that everybody goes through it you learn that ah oh, okay this is normal I'll get past it you know what I mean like it just makes it a little bit easier yeah 
you know, I, I really could just keep on talking to you. And I was really thinking that, um, you know, we, someone said that there should be a second session. And I really agree because I feel like <laughs> sessions like this probably need many, it, it should be a series because I think there's just, it almost we should have a session as like messages to our younger self because I wish that I had you know followed you on Instagram when I was a 17 year old and I and I you know instead I was here writing letters to dating websites being like how can I, get I wish I'd followed me on Instagram when I was 17. <laughs> right? I, I wish I'd known me then I didn't I was the biggest mess you ever met I was such a mess I was such an insecure mess <laughs> But I think that's, you know, it's part and parcel of growing up. But I, I, I know we didn't have time to go over the questions, but I was sort of scanning them from time to time. And I hope we've answered everything. It sounds like everyone had a good time. I was looking at the messages. Please, I think that Sanjeev has put uh, the feedback form. So it's on type form. If you can find it and you can fill it out, that would be amazing. And I'd really like to um express my deepest gratitude to you Seema I am so appreciative of the moments that I get I, I think especially now that the world is becoming increasingly digital and virtual to connect with a human being who shares the kind of passion for sexual health I I truly think that I'm living a life worth living when I meet people like you so thank you for oh, Varuna likewise thank you for just being you and thank you for being up here with me today of course, thank you.